So Dan, I'll turn to you. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thanks to Wida and Ken and Diego. Um, it's really good to be here and see so many people. Uh, particularly after the Naps game last night, I, I made a comment to my wife probably in April of this year that I can deal with trade wars and I can deal with the Naps playing poorly, but it was really taxing. Uh, emotionally to deal with both at once. Um, I wouldn't have guessed that in October that it would be the Nationals that sort of worked out the issues. Um, but, you know, happy, happy to be here. Uh, so I run a group called the Coalition for GSP. Um, I've been doing uh, GSP work since 2006. Our members are companies that import into the program and so all on the U.S. side. Um, and did a really good job of covering sort of what the GSP is, how many countries it applies to. Um, our number one message for all those years has been when the program's in place, it's the U.S. companies that save the money. When the program's not in place, it's the U.S. companies that pay. Um, that used to be a message that was much harder to carry on Capitol Hill, uh, but with so much focus on trade these days, you sort of walk in and say something like, U.S. companies pay, and they say, yeah, yeah, I know you're the fifth person to talk to me about tariffs today. Um, so in, in some respects, our jobs have gotten easier when talking about trade because everyone gets it now. They, they know the basics. Um, but this is, this is a, I think, has always been a challenge to talk about why imports are good for American companies. And, and so most of our members are actually small businesses. Um, I think our typical member has about 15 employees and saves about $100,000 a year um, under the GSP program. Um, I'm mostly going to focus on some of the dynamics as to what's happening here. Uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of opportunities for U.S. companies and, and GSP countries in the sense of um, there is basically a, a once a generation shop to supply chains right now as it relates to everything happening in China. Um, I don't want to make it sound like I'm endorsing China tariffs. Um, we have a number of members who are harmed by those. Uh, but there is a, a real mix. I think a lot of people look at 25% tariffs on most of the things that come in under GSP when, when imported from China um, as an opportunity to shift some of those supply chains and source more from GSP countries. Um, and, you know, we've sort of got the proof. I'm a, I'm a numbers person, uh, so we've got the proof in the numbers. Um, for the first time last year in 2018, uh, savings under the GSP program exceeded a billion dollars. Um, this year, uh, through August, savings are about $720 million, um, and that is after accounting for the fact that over $100 million of uh, tariffs have been paid since India and Turkey were removed from the program. Um, so you'd really be at a level now where you'd be at $800 plus million, and, and for context, um, only once between 2009 and 2015 did savings exceed $700 million for the full year. So we've really seen that usage of the program. Um, you know, it's up 50% or 60% in the last two years or so. And, and a lot of that growth, um, you know, it, it mentioned the, the expansion of travel goods. So that, that is a big piece of this. Um, that expansion of travel goods has sort of ramped up. And, and as that's gotten combined with um, new tariffs on China, uh, on a lot of those same products, um, you know, we've really seen U.S. imports of those take off. Um, but it's not just in the numbers. We do a lot of surveys of companies. We did a survey earlier this year. Um, 100 and something companies responded. Uh, and we asked them, you know, what have you done lately? What do you expect to do? Um, about 70% said so they'd increase their GSP imports in 2018. Um, slightly more expected to do so in 2019. Uh, along those same lines, about 70% of those companies had hired workers, uh, new workers in, in 2018, um, and about a similar number expected to do so in 2019. And, you know, I think that there is a, a, a broad consensus the economy's done really well, so, you know, lots of folks are hiring workers. Um, but in a lot of these cases, it's a, it's a, you know, a two-person company that hired eight workers. Um, so you're, you're talking about huge growth here based on their imports under GSP. Um, the research that we've done this year suggests that it is very much uh, Section 301 tariff driven. Um, so when we break down GSP imports this year for things that have been hit by tariffs from China and things that have not, um, the products where, where Chinese competitors face new tariffs um, are up about 20% this year. Uh, 
everything else, and that would include the stuff that sort of just went into effect uh, in September, because we don't have data through there yet, uh, is up about 8%. So you've got you know, two and a half times the growth um, for the products where Chinese competitors face new tariffs and, and GSP countries do not. Um, and that, that holds across most of the Asian countries there. Um, so Thailand's about two and a half percent faster for things where China's hit with new tariffs. Philippines, more than two percent, uh, two times faster. Indonesia, about 50 percent faster. Um, not surprisingly there, it's sort of Brazil as the outlier. Um, and, and in part because I think what you're seeing is regional shifts in supply chains. Um, the other interesting thing is that this doesn't actually hold for the rest of the world. If you look at imports that are not China and are not GSP, um, things subject to new tariffs from China so far are basically flat, and things where China uh, has not been hit with new tariffs yet are up. And so you've got something happening in the GSP space where, where it is, you know, those countries are overperforming, um, and I think that that is, you know, a, a realistic assessment of folks trying to figure out how do you avoid some of these China tariffs, what are good opportunities, and the GSP benefits being in place um, for one of those incentives that provide the opportunity to move for the long term. Um, the flip side of that is, as Ed was talking about, the new review processes and, and sort of the actions taken against, um, particularly India and Turkey, is you know, it raises real questions as to, is this a smart bet? Um, India and Turkey accounted for about a third of all GSP savings last year. Other countries that are currently under review, Thailand, Indonesia, and Kazakhstan, um, about a third more. And so there is, you know, in, in the most extreme example, two thirds of the benefits that were in place in 2018 could be gone by the time it comes up for congressional reauthorization next year. So now if you're in the company perspective and you're trying to figure out what do I do? Is it smart to get out of China uh, and move to a GSP country? You have to take into consideration the fact that those GSP benefits that you are hoping to take advantage of could be gone. Um, and you know, this is this is not a, a sort of for us because we work with so many companies and we do surveys and we're constantly asking for examples. Um, it's it's not a theoretical question on sort of how trade works. Um, it's very much nuts and bolts, and so. You know, that same company that had grown from two workers to ten workers has put everything on hold. They lost two of their major customers who just said, your prices, including tariffs from India, are too high for us. We're not going to stock your product anymore. So that stopped. Um, we've got a manufacturer who planned to go from about 35 to almost 50 employees. They canceled the expansion. That is just work that's not going to be done because Indian components are a huge part of their business. Uh, and we've got another company that was planning to double their U.S. workforce because they were going to stop importing finished goods from India and start importing components instead and doing final assembly in the U.S. Um, and that's canceled. And, and to my knowledge, that sort of business owner, um, either this week or last week, was in Mexico looking at plants there. Because for them, because they're so dependent on Indian components, even in this U.S. manufacturing plant, um, they can import from India into Mexico duty-free, do the work, have it go from Mexico to the U.S. duty-free, and cut out tariffs all around. Um, their plan was based on trying to win business that was not going to come from China because of tariffs and manufacture in the U.S. But that's all stopped. And so you've got this, I think there's a reluctance um, from a number of companies to make plans based on sort of GSP being in place, particularly where we have open reviews like Indonesia and Thailand. Um, because you just, you know, these are multi-year decisions and multi-year investments. Uh, and so there's a lot of additional risk. And I think what that does in some sense is also locks in the status quo where, where China is a preferred source even with 25% tariffs, um, which is a, you know, you, you think about that level and, and we've never really tried something across the board um, in, in recent history that anyone's been a practitioner on. Um, but when you dig into the data and we, we get down into a lot of product level stuff, um, China is still the low cost supplier even after accounting for 25% tariffs. And so where things like GSP can make a difference are, are really the things like travel goods um, where you do have high tariffs, you know, 15%, 20%. We'll grab it in a moment. I've got my backpack here that is from one of our members that comes in uh, from 
in Indonesia under GSP. Everyone can see what a 20% tariff backpack looks like. Um, but that's, you know, I think that's the situation that we're dealing with on the ground here. Um, lots of opportunities provided uh, by Section 301 tariffs, and, and I think general thinking of how do you shift supply chains, um, but also some real risks. And, and I think in a lot of ways, it, the administration's own policies um, offset or undermine each other. And I'll just close with one more example. Um, it's a company that we've worked with uh, that plan to increase their imports from India um, about 30-fold, so from about a million or so a year up into tens of millions of dollars a year. And the reason for this was they viewed Chinese suppliers, they were basically buying from India and China, those were the two you know, dominant suppliers for them, but also globally. I mean, when you look at US imports of these products, they basically come from India or China. Um, they were concerned that Chinese suppliers were actually intent on becoming competitors and supplanting them in the market. So they made a decision that they were going to start shifting as much as they could out of China. Um, and India was the other, other location. Um, but along the way, India lost its GSP benefits. And, and this product is actually one of the few products uh, that has avoided being on any of the China Section 301 lists, in part due to comments submitted, I think, that this would really hurt U.S. industry to have to pay tariffs. And so you've got a, a very sort of strange or unique situation where you're basically telling people to buy from China and not from India because tariffs hurt. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's just one of those things that makes you wonder, you know, GSP is there, uh, you know, its reason to be is to convince to incentivize folks to buy from GSP countries instead of others. Uh, it seems like that's where we want to go on China, uh, and a lot of people are taking that opportunity, but some of the actions that um, the administration has taken directly undermines that. Thank you so much, Shan. I'm, I really appreciate, as always, your very practical perspective on this, and I think it's also very powerful to, to really hear how these supply chains are so interconnected in a decision in one area affects things in others. So I'm going, I think we're going to maybe shift a little bit out of, of GSP too and turn to Steve. I do hope maybe you'll pick up a little bit on, on the India points that have been raised. And I also, I, you know, it was mentioned earlier, what about non-tariff measures between, we've been talking a lot about preferences which really affect duties um, on goods, but what about non-tariff issues and, and you know, Steve and I have worked for many years on regional trade agreements in Africa in particular, where a lot of these issues are being dealt with right now in real time in a very interesting way um, at, at multiple levels. So I'm sure you will mention some of that as well. Um, I hope so. If you don't, we can talk about that in the discussion. But I turn to Steve Landy for his comments. Thank you. Well, when you have worked on a subject for more than 50 years and you're given six or ten minutes to talk, it's it. a challenge. We can talk very quickly like New Yorkers do, or we can talk slowly and make sure you understand. Well, first, let me make a couple of confessions. If one, if one issue has caused me a problem in 44 years of my 55 years of marriage, it has been GSP. <laughs> when GSP started, it had the nick, I had the nickname of the father of GSP, which was fine. I appreciated that. However, we are not Christian. We do not believe in immaculate conception in any way. And my wife, for the last 44 years, had asked me, who the goddamn wife of GSP if you were the father of GSP? And then I don't have an answer for that. Two, I also have to make another confession. I feel guilty. But if anyone in this room is to blame for this problem we have of self-election by countries who maybe are not entitled to developing country status, maybe me. Because I remembered. In 1976-77, towards the end of the Tokyo round, Ambassador Shrasman, I was kind of his troubleshooter from New York, like he called me, he said, go ahead and solve this problem. I want to get this, uh, this Tokyo round finished and so on. So I went out, and one of the issues we were felt with was graduation. And I said, ah, poor India, we can't complain. Just let them keep GSP. We're not going to discuss anything other than self-election. So we did that. I felt guilty about that, however, until 1992 or 1991, when Bob Zellick, excuse me, until 2001 or 2002, when Bob Zellick made the same decision. Because you may remember that after 9-11, if you're old enough, 
that the first agreement we entered, international agreement that was extremely important was the agreement to launch the Doha round. And Bob Shas was there, the Indians said, just like they always said, please don't touch self-election principles with LDCs. Bob Zellick said, well, we got a few more important issues, sure. And ever since then, we've had trouble with the Doha round because we've tried to claw back on whatever commitment Bob made, which was necessary to get the agreement launched. So this is one reason I felt we have this very basic, uh, we have this very basic problem and so on. There has never been a better U.S. DR negotiator than, uh, than Bob Lanners. And I say this even though I may not agree with many of the policies, but if you look at the U.S. DR, job as a negotiator is to fulfill the requirements. Sometimes they're more involved with policy, other times less, and I don't know exactly how this White House works. I do know the President very well. But in terms of getting agreements in place, setting up agreements, I think that the current USTR and his team has done an unbelievably good job. And I have to say that's true as well for this issue of graduation. This issue was really not on the table in any way, shape, or form, and now it is on the table and it is being discussed and so on, et cetera. As usual, there's a difference between the rhetoric that's used by the president and perhaps what the U.S. proposal is, and maybe I can be corrected if I misunderstood it, but my reading is the president said, we are going to take unilateral action against countries which claim special and differential in treatment when they're not entitled to it. The actual proposal that I have read, and again I say subject to correction by others who may follow the issue closer, says no. What we're willing to do, that if a country fulfills four criteria and so on, we are willing to let them keep their current special and differential treatment, but not ask for new special and differential treatment in terms of new negotiations. And so another criteria include income, I don't know if there's a market access, this includes OECD membership, etc. So there's four very specific criteria and so on. When I compliment the negotiating prowess of this administration, I really compliment their ability to bring every single possible issue on the table when you're discussing it. So here is Brazil, used to be a very big proponent of special and differential treatment, now agreeing to forego it in the future as part of a bigger deal made with the U.S. government. I don't know the elements other than one element was that they could join the OECD, which is one of the requirements in terms of being able to keep, uh, not being subject to US, uh, U.S. action. The next exciting event, I think, takes place in November, when the U.S. will take a list which they currently have, I don't remember how many countries are under consideration, but they're going to choose those countries where they believe graduation is appropriate, is appropriate and we should look at it and so on. Um, as to the current situation visa India and Africa, my own feeling is that this is an issue which could be resolvable as far as this whole question of graduation. People may not realize it, but there are four forms already that takes place where countries like India and more advanced developing countries perhaps are treated differently than we'll say other countries are and so on, etc. One is this whole exercise of plurilateral agreements where you just simply go, we're going to go with a like-minded country, come to an agreement has a very big disadvantage in that when you want to bring China, India, so they are the ones you really want to get disciplines from, and you don't include them in the agreement, you don't get the disciplines, and all of the abilities of the WTO that allows you to retaliate or seek compensation doesn't apply in these plurilateral agreements for non-members. But nevertheless, that's one tool. Secondly, there's a number of existing agreements which does differentiate, does differentiate among developing countries and so on. They don't treat all developing countries the same and so on. Uh, there are special rules, for example, on subsidies and so on. There are special rules related with performance requirements and investments. So there are already a differentiation. One can go that, down that path. Number three, any negotiation sets its own rules. So if we ever do have another negotiation, there's no reason why we can't come up with different levels of benefits for different countries within those agreements. So we're not there. And four is what I talk about, the big deal, which is outside of the context of this agreement. This big deal currently, by the way, is being worked out with India, now, which is very interesting. As you know, they're going to have a small package soon and then hopefully a larger package. They are discussing some of the real tough issues that are in the WTO, one of which is telecommunications. 
And the way they are dealing with tele, excuse me, with um, what do you call it, data flow, of course, borders and so on. E commerce, thank you. Uh, we still don't know. Wait, wait, get back in the 70s. Sorry, e commerce and so on, et cetera. Uh, but anyway, they're now talking about setting up three colors, which sounds a lot like subsidies. Those e commerce areas where you may have a right to limit, which are green. Those where you may not have, a, where you may not want to limit and just allow them to, where you could insist that they have be free flow, which you call green, those which are red, and of course the negotiations around those which are yellow, which could be a formula basically that you use in the WTO if you decide to move that way. So there are possibilities that you could work out an agreement outside with India, and maybe they could even be brought into the WTO area and so on. A couple of words in Africa because time is short and we've agreed we're going to allow a lot of time for Q's and A's and so on, etc. The most exciting thing happening in the international trade system today, which is positive, is the fact that 55 countries, ranging from Arab countries up north to middle of some of the uh, real bad, I should say, some of the poorest countries in the world, are, have now agreed on forming an African continental free trade agreement. At the same time as the EU was disrupting in front of ourselves, as we struggled with the North American Free Trade Agreement, we ended up with something to take its place and so on. But Africa is moving in this very positive development, in this very positive direction. And people don't realize it again, but there's a lot of doubt with Africa, oh, they're never going to succeed, you know, well, they're going to sign something. Paper. This agreement is almost on automatic pilot now. Once 22 countries ratified the agreement, I think they're up to the 30s now, the agreement was made, the agreement went into effect. And duties will be reduced, hopefully, by, by July 1st, 2020. Uh, the only thing that required is an agreement on an origin rule, where the basic agreement's in place. There's an agreement where you can't agree initially, you'll just have MFN apply. You won't apply the preferential duties until they were so therefore, it's going to be agreed upon. And countries have to submit tariff schedules. However, unlike other agreements, the tariff schedules don't have to be negotiated with other countries. They've agreed on criteria, where you have to reduce a given percentage of products over a given period of time. And once you do that notification, the agreement goes into effect for you and any other country which has already submitted a similar notification. And those two things shall take place. And the amount of liberalization is unbelievable. For 70, for 90 percent of the products traded by the more important countries, would probably account for 80 percent of the trade. 90 percent of the duties are going to be eliminated over five years, 20 percent a year. An additional 7 percent is going to be eliminated over a period of 10 years, meaning 10 percent a year. That's what's going to happen in this trade. Given the fact that many uh, the many duties in Africa are higher than world average duties anywhere. Some are zero, but some are up to 20% and so on. That's a significant duty flow. And by that itself, you're going to see a significant impact on trading system. Perhaps more important, and then to make my concluding remark and so on, is the fact that, uh, is the fact that phase one mainly focused on products, general rules on services, not very specific rules, and uh, on dispute settlement, et cetera, and origin. Phase two gets into the issues which are under discussion now in the WTO in some kind of format. Electronic commerce, we think, is not officially on the agenda, but there is discussion that will be. Competitiveness is going to be on their intellectual property rights. This offers an unbelievable opportunity for the United States, which has now indicated full support of this African Continental Free Trade Agreement, has actually set up and actually had their first meeting I think earlier this month or the previous month where they actually began discussing detail. Phase two is now what's under discussion within the African Union. It's these particular obligations that fit into what are the subjects that are being discussed in the WTO. And it does offer an opportunity free of the WTO debate that we mentioned earlier to make a lot of progress and maybe these results can actually be moved in to the context of the WTO. The only plea I make to uh, USDR, if they're there, please consider special treatment for South Africa. 
I'm not arguing it on development purposes because the issues there are pretty well known and so on, although they are extremely poor. Uh, there are areas that are extremely poor. In fact, when you are looking at this whole question of graduation, maybe a way to move is to say countries that have significant populations still in rural areas maybe can get some escapes in agriculture. You know, that's a tough political issue, but those are some of the compromises. But when you are working on this issue, when Africa is at the verge of forming this economic integration, which is absolutely fantastic because our markets our exports are much more competitive in Africa than they are, we'll say, in China and other places and so on. If you, could, uh, if you could treat South Africa as part of this African continental free trade agreement, and you don't want to have your bilateral discussions, fine. That would be extremely helpful because it would be extremely disruptive to start differentiating among African countries at the time that they are trying to form this very healthy kind of an agreement. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much.